Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, peace be upon you all. Welcome to today's show discussing different aspects of Muharram. Today we're going to be discussing the momentous, outstanding, powerful sermon of the sister of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, Sayyidah Zainab, peace be upon her. After the Battle of Karbala, she was faced with many trials, but perhaps her most defining trial and defining moment was the moment where she spoke in the court of Yazid and shook his throne and the world forever as we have today. To discuss today's topic, we have three esteemed guests. We've got Sheikh Abbas Banju, Sayyid Mohsin Shah, and Muntazir Jafar to provide some poetry for us. Sheikh, we've looked at the idea of what happened on the of Ashura. We all know what happened, it's documented. But for many people, the story ends there. Can you tell us what was Say the Zainab's stance in this moment where she stood in front of the palace of Yazid and maybe describe the weight of this because it's not just a lady talking to somebody, it's a very big deal. Of course, um, <clears throat> the divine position of Say the Zainab al Kubra within the court of Yazid al La'in, if we were to understand the magnitude of this at that point in time and for the rest of history and humanity as we know it till today. It is important for us to analyze the stance of Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra in light of the stance of her mother, Sayyidat Nisa al-Alameen. For the khutbah, the mannerism and the circumstances, there are many parallels in the mannerisms and the circumstances in the style of speech in which Sayyidah Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen confronts the tyrants of her time and the manner in which Sayyidat Zainab al Kubra alayhi salam confronts the tyrant of her time. You see, there are two parallels, and each one is needed in order to understand and to get a cumulative understanding of the goal and the impact and the weight of the khutbah of Sayyidat Zainab alayhi salam. And you find over here that one thing which is extremely important for us to understand from the many dimensions that are there within the khutbah of uh, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam is where she says to Yazid, do you think, to paraphrase, and the, the, the words in the khutbah verbatim and the words of Sayyidah Zainab, the manner in which she says it is of course much more eloquent. But to paraphrase and to give you the idea is when she confronts Yazid and she says, do you think that because now you seem to have this apparent power and control over this kingdom and you've come across as being all powerful, do you think that that means God favors you? And she quotes a verse of the Quran, which I shall pull out for you um, in a little bit. Uh, when she quotes this verse of the Quran and she addresses Yazid in this manner, it puts out for us another massive rule of thumb through which we are able to differentiate between haq and batil even in our daily lives today. She says to Yazid, do you think just because you have the apparent power and you are on the seat of authority that Allah has favored you over us? And the fact that we are standing in front of you apparently as slaves with our hands shackled, that w you are greater than us and God has favored you more than he has favored us. This has a very deep point. Say the Zainab over here in the eyes of the Awam is making very clear 
that even within the Islamic world, outside the, excuse me, outside the Islamic world, being in a state of power does not necessarily mean that you are right. Mm. Many times when we want to evaluate historical events, when we want to understand current political events, we tend to think when there are two sides in a conflict, because this one party is in power, then they have to be correct. Many people think like this. Many people think, huh, because for example, I don't want to bring in any names of any countries and make this any political, but you look at within the Islamic world, you look at within the Islamic world, you can have an Islamic government that performs crimes and that is involved in tyranny to the highest level, but the wider Muslim Ummah will not condemn them. Why? Because they are in power. And because they are in power, therefore they have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence that government is right. Had they been wrong, Allah would not have given them this much success or yeah. given them this much power. Sayyidah Zainab salam broke this mentality inside. She said, just because you are in the seat of power and using the name of Islam doesn't mean that you are on haq. She's saying this for the wider people to understand this. And this is a very important rule of thumb, which even we need to apply when it comes to understanding current political, ideological uh, disputes and battles that we're faced with in the world that we live today. Yeah. Sayyid Mohsen, looking at the speech itself, it's a very, as Sheikh mentioned, a very eloquent speech. And no matter how much we break it down, we can't, talk about the eloquence enough and clearly comes from her father we know the contents of the speech but and I want to ask you however what is your favorite maybe line of the speech or part of the speech or lesson from the speech if you want to do that do it that way that really hits you I think the best part of the speech, and it's not just for me, I think a lot of people share this uh, moment and it's rhetoric, is that when he challenges her and says, oh, um, do you like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you think Allah subhanahu wa of what Allah has done to you and your family? And she replies, I saw nothing but beauty. Yeah. I think that to, to, to it, 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 because let's be real, what did she see? But nothing but bloodshed. What did she see? Yeah. Nothing but bloodshed. You know, and you know, she even witnessed her brother is you know being um, butchered in that way. She saw all of it, but yet she still sees like the the, the marafa and and the wisdom, and and she still sees you could say the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sees it, mm. and she could see his level and his status being raised and raised mm. and raised. It's and that famous kind of proverb that's used in many religions that. The, the friends of God see through the eyes of God. Maybe that's what she saw uh, in this, perhaps. Perhaps, but I think she understood the yeah. true reality of Imam Hussein and of, of his actions. Um, so that's my favorite bit of the speech. And also, uh, you know, when we look at the speech, if we look at the way Yazid, uh, the Mal'un, the way he actually set up the whole gathering was to mock and humiliate Bani Hashim. Yeah. There were so many different uh, important figures in that courtroom. People from different governors, different leaders, people who have been probably who have witnessed uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speak, uh, people of great political importance. And I guess he set that up to, to ridicule and mock and humiliate Bani Hashim and also to confirm his victory and his power and that now I am you know, you know the, the leader of the Muslims whereas it totally backfired mm. with the sermon of Sayyidah Zainab alayha, and her reminding the people of Rasulullah her reminding the people of her father and in a way reminding them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the true sacrifice Imam uh, Hussein has, has you know um, that has done um, I think that's what's fantastic mm -hmm. and beautiful about the speech. What do you think, brother? 
I think the, the speech itself, one of the things that strikes me in the speech is the bravery with which she spoke. Um, I think after having a father like Amir Mu'minin Ahli bin Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, I think um, you'd expect nothing less mm-hmm. from, from a, a, such an epitome of mountain of patience and, and, and courage like that than to walk into the darbar of the one who's, who's, who's rights, who, who've taken away her rights. And to say that you can do whatever you want, you can. She, I think the exact words were "kid kaidek" in Arabic. She says, "You plot your plot, you do whatever you want to do." But at the end of the day, know that our reward lies with Allah the same way that your destruction lies in His hands as well. Ahsant. And I think to go in with that that sort of uh, courage, and to remind everybody of the status of Yazid's ancestors compared to the ancestors of Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alaihi. Yazid is the son of the freed slaves. Mm-hmm. He's Ibn al Tulaqa. Mm-hmm. But Sayyidah Zainab is the, is the daughter of the one in whose house the revelation came. There's no comparison. Mm-hmm. It's true. I mean, her speech is like a piece of art in the sense that if you snapshot any part of it, it becomes a piece of art in itself. Um, and there are so many quotables from it. I mean, the, the two that come to my mind is something quite simple the fact that she thanks God. No. At the end, for the for for what happened, I mean, for us in this day and age to understand that is, is so much, and also the idea of her, um, I would say, looking towards the future. She says, "Our memory will never be erased," almost like a prophecy of the future that you watch what's going to happen, that our memory mm-hmm. will never go. Sheikh, I think one thing that comes to my mind actually is when you look at all the sermons of of, of the Holy Family, and this sermon included, they always start. They always have a structure, even the supplications have a structure. The supplication starts with praise of God, <coughs> then perhaps saying the needs and the weakness of the human being. Say the Zayna, peace be upon her, as a similar structure here, she starts praising, praising God, explaining who she is, then gives her take. What can we learn from this, the idea of starting with, with God first? Sure. Um, you have a look, like you rightfully pointed out, this, uh, Every sermon of Ahlul Bayt has began with the word Alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's not a coincidence that the first surah which is placed in the Quran, Surah Al Fatiha, begins with Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. This surah without which your salat becomes invalid. You begin with Alhamdulillah. Suratul Al-Habd. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Every salat that you recite, if you omit Suratul Al-Habd, your salat becomes batil. So when you look at these three inside of a scale, you find that the speech of Ahlul Bayt is a full reflection of the Quran in its entirety. Mm-hmm. Like the way the Quran begins with Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. The speech of every one of the Ahlul Bayt begins with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen because they are the Quranun Natik. They are the uh, or they are the live Quran and the speaking version of this Quran, the reflection of the Quran in its entirety. This is one. Number two, it shows us the sacrifice where the goal of this sacrifice from this phrase alhamdulillah rabbil alamin you are able to understand the goal of the sacrifice how say the zainab al kubra alayha salam with this level of infallibility with which she is blessed ismat al sughra and this is from understanding the rights of say the zainab al kubra alayha salam that she was endowed with a level of infallibility which is attested to by Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam Ya Amma alhamdulillah anti alima ghair mu'allama wa fahima ghair mufahama alima ghair mu'allama the untaught scholar yeah. so where did that ilm come from? this is an ilm which is achieved through ghaib and it is restricted for a group of individuals that have reached a level of infallibility so the infallibility of Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra uh, has differences in regards to the infallibility of the Ahlul Bayt as stated within the Qur'an, the 14 individuals that we have 
Isma has different levels, has different scopes, has different dimensions. In any case, when Sayyidah Zainab says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, she is in a state of gratitude that, thank you, Ya Allah, I thank God for having chosen us to be those individuals who are going to be the ultimate sacrifice as a result of which people will be able to seek guidance until the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. This is a responsibility that no other creation could have taken. And this leads us to, to the realm of Alam al Mithaq and why Sayyidah Zainab was in that place at that time and this divine covenant and pledge that they took even before this dunya was created. But look at her understanding of her servitude towards Allah Azza wa Jal. At that point, having seen the massacre and the martyrdom of her entire family, being enslaved and being brought into Sham, the first thing that comes to her mind is not to complain to Allah, not to blame Allah, Rather, the total opposite, praise Allah. Awesome. And this for us, on a, on, on a, in terms of implementing lessons on a daily life, can never be at the level of Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra. However, what we are able to learn from the seerah of Sayyidah Zainab is that even us in our daily lives, when we come across difficulties, the first thing we need to do is say, Alhamdulillah. Supposed to say, Alhamdulillah. It's a complete change of mindset. Complete set of mind change. Ahsantum. Bain al Qawsin again, between brackets. Do you know that this phrase of Alhamd is supposed to nourish within the Muslim Ummah the sentiment of being somebody who is absolutely optimistic? Mm. The Muslim Ummah, which was built by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was an ummah built on optimism. And you find this again from Surah Al-Hamd. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Baba, at the time of Fajr, at the time of Dhuhr and Asr, Maghrib and Aisha, even if you have had the worst day in your life and everything has gone wrong for you, Still in your salat, it is matloob. You will stand up and say, Alhamdulillah. You can get fired at 11 a.m. from your job. One o'clock salat al-dhuhr comes, you have to say, Alhamdulillah. Mm. Supposed to have an impact on our mindset. No matter what happens in the dunya, what trials and tribulations fall upon you, you still have to praise Allah. You still praise Allah because... This alhamd teaches you up to be an optimistic person and that whatever happens in the dunya, whatever in your destiny is controlled ultimately by him. And you are refer returning back to that person who has absolute control over destiny, number one. Number, number two, it could be a test that you are facing. It could be an imtihan. Negativities happen in life is a way of imtihan. Whether you have been steadfast or not, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making you steadfast until that point. And these are one of the many, many lessons we're able to draw from the khutbah or from this one phrase. Yeah, of the khutbah just just one, absolutely. Lesson. One phrase, you can write a whole book on this. Uh, Muntazir um, has some poetry regarding uh, Sayyidah Zainab. Um, if you could please recite a few lines for us and our audience, that would be much appreciated. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Go through history. Go through history and find me a relationship with more resistance than that of Hussein and Zainab. Because even death couldn't separate the two. For Hussein's head reciting Quran on the spear, while Zainab's words in Yazid's heart would strike fear. She spoke and Ali spoke within her voice. I saw nothing but beauty, for it was only God's choice. Fakid Kaidak, plot how you may, our remembrance will never be removed. Nay, for Yazid may have lost the battle and lost the war. As Sheikh Mawaz Panjah said, 
Yazid lost the battle and he lost the war. A loss that started when Zahra was crushed behind the door, taking after her mother, not afraid to stand for what's right. Oh, the son of the freed slaves, how dare you come and fight? Oh, the son of the freed slaves, how dare you come and fight? SubhanAllah, very, very powerful. Last bit of the discussion, Sayyid Mawson, bringing you in here. The idea of public speaking in front of an audience, perhaps. Obviously, there's much discussion in the religion over time about the role of women speaking in front of a, a public audience. And we've seen clearly that Sayyidah Zainab did this. But not just for women. What's the... What is the Islamic position, first of all, on women being, being able to do this, being in the public sphere and speaking? I mean, in terms of um, the Islamic opinion and in terms of when it comes to the violation of human rights and, and fighting for justice and for haq, women, we've seen in history, Islamic history, women are given a platform, not just a platform, but they have been successful in fighting oppression. And we have this with Sayyidah Zahra, Fatu Zahra, Salaamu Alayha, and her, when Fadiq was taken away from her, and she went to the, to, you know, the courts, and she went to those Mal'uns, and she um, gave the speech on, on, not just the speech, but she gave the evidences, and she gave her, you know, her, her position and her authority, she gave the evidence, she gave Quranic references, and she was like, why have you done this injustice upon me? And why are you taken away uh, you know, this, this, my right and my property. So we have, you know, the Islamic position here with, with uh, Sayyidah Zahra, uh, you know, giving this. And, and we, you know, it kind of rubbed off on her daughter as well. Yeah. Where we have Sayyidah Zainab. Not just one khutbah, there's two. two yeah, people forget, the, people forget about Ibn Kufa. Ziyad, yeah. Yes, there, there's, a, there's a sermon in Kufa and also a sermon in, in you know, in, in Damascus. Sure. So... I, I hope this is an encouragement and motivation and inspiration for our Muslim women, um, especially all over the world, where they're being oppressed. Whether it is in you know Europe, parts of Europe, who are banning the hijab, and, and or whether it's you know um, other parts of, of Asia where the religion is being attacked, that women can have a platform to speak and mm -hmm. also a platform, you know, to to actually express themselves and also to to fight injustice. Um, what, what about you, brother Mandir? Do, do you think that you know we have? Significant examples and, and, and significant uh, people that we can look up to. I think we definitely do. I think we <coughs> definitely, definitely do. If you look at um, going further back in history, where even at the time where the the rights of the women were taken away by the men themselves, if you look at Fir'aun and his wife, and the proximity his wife came to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from for for from the oppression that she was facing, I think now it's the same. I think definitely, definitely, there's scope for people who are fighting oppression, mm. um, for the women to stand up, base, their, base themselves on Sayyidah Fatima Sayyid Zahra alayhi salam, not compromise their values and still be able to stand for what's right. Yeah, I think it's an important thing to think about and we will make the mistake that Sayyidah Zainab's sermon in standing up is not just for women. Uh, in fact, they are every human being, regardless of their gender, can actually learn from the fact that when it's time to speak, it's time to speak, regardless of your gender. Um, Sheikh, to maybe close, although on, a, on this is quite a big topic, what are this sermon? I want you to draw and say, most in touched upon this. What are the parallels between the sermon of Bibi Zainab, peace be upon her, and her mother, peace be upon her, when her when her land was taken away and when her um, the right of her husband was taken away? Where can we draw these parallels? Where where, where did we see sh shades of Zainab's mother within herself? <clears throat> Um, this is a question that would require us to sit down with text, with both the khutbah of Sayyidat Risa al Alameen and the khutbah of Sayyidat Zainab alayhi salam, in order for us to draw the parallels in the words and in the ideas that are there. However, when you look into them, number one, there was the element that, in terms of personality, Yep. And then there is elements in terms of the actual content of the speech. Um, you find that in both circumstances, both these holy women surpassed, or both these holy women 
um, they were above and beyond intimidation. Sayyidah Zainab salam, being in the state in which she was brought into the courtyard of Yazid, al the severed head of her brother in front of her. The fact that the rest of the children are brought in as slaves. The fact that you were surrounded and you were in the fort of your enemy and you were a minority within a minority. Despite all these factors put together, she was not intimidated. Same thing with Sayyidah Zahra alayhi yeah. salam. Her lung has been punctured. Her ribs have been broken. She has just lost Mohsin. She has seen her husband, Amirul Mu'mineen, being dragged into the mosque with a rope around his neck. She has just lost her father, Rasulullah. Despite that, she comes into the mosque. She's not intimidated in order to deliver the message of Allah. So what you take in terms of parallel for these two women is that person should not be intimidated by circumstances or situations when it comes to defending the right of Allah Azza wa Jal, defending the religion. What is also important is that you take this into consideration when um, you have the talk about uh, the role of women and speaking and so on and so forth in the religion, right? Uh, as the question that you had just posed earlier. It's also important for us that when we study the maqam of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam and the maqam of Sayyidah Nisa al-Alameen alayhi salam, and we try and use these two stances to deduce the role of women in society. And today, there are a number of conditions which are, or there are a number of uh, functions that are absolutely important for us to take into consideration such that we do not uh, come to an incorrect conclusion. The first is that Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam was forced into the courtyard of Yazid. She didn't go there out of her own free will to address and to speak to Yazid. And in fact, she says that in her sermon. She says, I do not even see you as somebody befitting enough for me to talk to you. But the circumstances dictate that. She enjoys scolding him, so she was scolding further. So number one, Sayyidah Zainab was not there out of will. Number two, Sayyidat Nisa al-Alameen alayhi salam, when she went into the masjid, we have within our traditions that the manner in which she walked towards Masjid al-Nabawi, you are able, Maraja have deduced at least from what I know, and perhaps there is more, at least 10 Ahkam Shara'i just from the manner in which Sayyidah Zahra walked from her home to the masjid. Mm. Ten Ahkam Shara'i. She came out surrounded by a group of women. This has a hukum Shara'i. The manner of her hijab, seven levels or seven layers of hijab that Sayyidah Nisa al Alameen wore. And when she did come to the mosque, she commanded for a hijab to be drawn between her and the people of Saqifa and the Muhajirin and the Ansar who were present inside of the mosque. So when we quote or when we want to understand, yeah. for example, um, the role, the boundaries, the ahkam, the so on and so forth, which is attached to the role of women in society, not to say that a woman doesn't have any role in society, it's not what I'm trying to say, huh? but when we are analyzing their roles and we are deducing a hukum shar'i, we have to be very, very precise. And we have to take into consideration these major points that then allow us to define the scope, the boundaries, 
and the potential that is Islam has given uh, uh, to, to, to women in, in their role of building the society and building the deen. Always remember, behind every great prophet, there was a great mother. Mm. There's a great woman who gave, who gave birth to the prophet. For every great companion that you have of Ahlul Bayt, there was this great woman who was responsible for building these men who would then go on to change history forever. These are things to take into consideration. Thank you very much for that fitting closing. We would like to thank our viewers uh, from all over the world for watching the show. And I'm sure, like myself, you have learned much from this. We can only really close with that phrase that Sayyid Mohsen talked about. I saw nothing but beauty. And truly, if you analyze every single line of Sayyid Zainab's sermon or her stance, we see nothing but beauty. I would like to close the show by asking Brother Montezer to recite a eulogy. The eulogy that I want to present is, a, is basically the khutbah of Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayha, um, where she stood there and she was addressing the people. Uh, <laughs> شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں میں وارث تطہیر ہوں میں وارث تطہیر ہوں نام سے نبی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں بازار سے دربار میں لے آئے ہو مجھ کو چاہو تو جلا سکتی ہوں خطبوں سے میں تم کو صابر کی بہن ہوں جو میں صابر کی بہن ہوں جو میں خاموش کھڑی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں افسوس کنیزی میں اسے مانگ رہے ہو تم جس کے غلاموں کی غلامی میں رہے ہو یہ ظلم نہ ہوگا کبھی یہ ظلم نہ ہوگا کبھی میں زندہ بھی ہوں اے شام کے لوگوں میں بنتے علی ہوں اللہ اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم